and thank all of you for joining us today. As we continue to navigate this new normal, or more like new abnormal, we're happy to have the opportunity to bring you information you can use right now through the series of webinars and to keep you all connected until we can meet again. It's through the efforts of our corporate members like Avasant that we are able to provide this thought leadership. It is yet another example of members helping members because we are all in this together. During this webinar, which by the way has enormous attendance, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask questions. And should you wish to replay this webinar at any time, it will be available in IOP's Knowledge Center and on the COVID-19 resource page accessible from IOP's homepage within 24 hours. Thank you. And now please allow me to introduce Kevin Parikh, CEO and Chairman of Avasant. Kevin, it's all yours. Debbie, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the introduction. I hope all of you are staying safe uh, and, and taking, of course, necessary uh, precautions uh, for your employees and your families. I looked forward today to speaking with you. I've been giving some talks on the impacts of COVID-19, particularly uh, how it's impacting the technology and outsourcing and digital industry. And today I'm bringing together uh, many of those thoughts and some of our best research to help provide some insights, I hope, into where the markets are going and how to prepare. What's important to understand is that we've actually been here before. Um, of course, it's not exactly the same kind of challenge that we have here with COVID-19, but if you recall the credit crisis not too long ago, in 2009, we experienced similar business impacts and restriction on money and the movement of money due to insufficient credit facility. In many ways, we are seeing the same thing. Um, companies are asking their service providers, their vendors, for a little extra time to make those payments, moving from 45 day pay cycles to 60 and 90 day pay cycles. Certainly that's happening. And that's one of the parallels to the credit crisis. But we have some other impacts as well that are making this particularly complicated. There's also similarities to the dot-com bust and post 9-11, where there have been travel restrictions and people have been uncomfortable getting onto aircraft, or in this case, almost unable to travel. And so the combination of those factors is also driving some unique and uh, surprising outcomes. We're also seeing how the stay home orders are driving unemployment rates. And so we wanted to do some analysis on how those unemployment rates are comparing to crises of the past. You can see on this slide that post 9-11, we had about four years of recovery. We're looking at about a 6% civilian unemployment rate, okay? That civilian unemployment rate uh, rose all the way to 10% in the credit crisis. So I want to kind of help you understand that there is a significant change going on here from what we see with COVID-19 in terms of magnitude. The credit crisis took us eight years to recover. The 9-11 the crisis took us about four years to recover, okay? And COVID-19 is, is driving us now upwards of 10%. And we believe if you listen to certain macroeconomic predictions, potentially up to 20% unemployment rate with 22 million Americans applying for unemployment in just the last four weeks. Now, how quickly those people get back to work, how quickly jobs and normalcy returns will impact how quickly the recovery happens. So while I doubt it will quite, it's not going to be a 16 year recovery cycle, I'm certain of that, but there is a prolonged recovery we can see here, and this is quite significant. 22 million Americans applying for unemployment is unprecedented when on a monthly basis, we, ex we usually have about a quarter million. Quite, quite, quite amazing numbers. So the world economy is experiencing the worst recession since the Great Depression, per the International Monetary Fund. 
global growth in 2020 will fall to minus 3%. Cumulative loss of global GDP over 20, from 2020 to 2021 is expected to be around 9 trillion. Global trade will fall by up to 32%. That's a 32% decline. And that is in very impactful in terms of the reciprocal and cumulative impact of this potential damage. Downward pressure on global FDI, foreign direct investment, is really at 40%. When the time we wrote this presentation, it was 30 to 40. It looks like it's going to be beyond 40%. Huge, huge impact. We published uh, this in March, right out of the gates, right as the stay home orders were coming. What we wanted to do is analyze by vertical, what are the impacts to those verticals? And how are they recovering and how will they recover and in the long run as well? So that was a continuing study. After we published it, Forbes contacted us, it was about March 14th and said, um, could we republish this information? And we, 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 we did, we gave it to them, no fee, nothing. We said, you're happy to have it and we'll give you whatever other information we are, we are developing. When they republished it, they had a huge response because what, what, it, what is impactful here is the severity level, okay? So coming out of the gates, public utilities, uh, one of our clients like so Southern California Edison, they had, to, they had to provision over 20,000 laptops in a week. How are they gonna acquire and find these technologies? And what was the impact on the supply chain? And so moving literally tens of millions of people across the world home has been a significant impact. I just came off a call with uh, one of the service providers um, that we all know well, and they were giving me a story about how they moved their entire business home. Huge impacts. And in certain industries like high tech, they've seen a lot of growth because they're selling a lot of microchips and a lot of laptops. In other industries like public sector, not as much, not as much. But you know, it stayed pretty, pretty resilient in terms of it's been flat. Uh, I would argue that healthcare has been tremendously impacted. Uh, no elective procedures going on. Um, they're not making a, a ton of money. Hospitals, at least in California where I live, are still empty. So depending on the industry, the impacts are very different. But what's interesting to understand here is how dynamic they're changing. We all know travel and transportation has been, it has been heavily impacted. So look at what just one month to today has changed. There's already been improvements in certain industries, okay? And with these improvements, we're seeing some hope for recovery. Even in retail, um, even in uh, entertainment and media, with bright spots, with digital media like Netflix and, and Disney Plus, we're seeing even some, some bright spots in transportation with increased supply chain uh, requirements to, to sh send and ship goods home. So this is, there is already recovery happening. There's also some winners. And I think this is really important for all of us to understand. 30% increase in stock just in the last, what, 30 days? Amazon, they've hired 100,000 new workers. We all know this, just to cope up with demand. Netflix, what a great story there. Zoom, video, we're using today, 118% increase in market cap, 11% increase in Microsoft shares, 18% stock increase in Gilead. Gilead is uh, posting that they may have some medication and potential solutions to attract COVID, uh, attack COVID-19. So there are some bright spots here, but there is going to be market volatility and I think we can expect that market volatility until we see a vaccine.
So I want to talk about um, a few areas of focus, which I think are really uh, impacting brick and mortar. We've all been talking for the last few years about the importance of digitizing our business, of driving to omni-channel, of driving to unified communications, and becoming more available to clients, and ultimately moving more to B2C models, even as B2B businesses. And as we do that, those companies that have done it are in a better position today uh, than those that have not. And so the end of brick and mortar, I believe, is truly upon us today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about unified communications, the importance of employee health and culture, strategic vendor relationships, and digital and global supply chains, okay? These are the key tenants of where we're going. So survivors are investing in unified communications and remote working platforms. Let's talk a little bit about this. Broadband collaboration. One of the big impacts that we have in this economy versus other economies is the ability to have 5G and high broadband width collaboration. Think about the economies of old, 9-11, okay, and even 2009. We would not have been able to move people at home so quickly. So broadband is making this possible. Over 1,000 increase in Microsoft Teams video calls, 200,000% increase, okay, in meeting minutes on Microsoft Teams. I talked to one CIO just last week she told me they do 50,000 meetings a day on Teams. 50,000 meetings a day. They have 30,000 people in the organization. Over 300% increase in Zoom daily usage from before the pandemic. So there's huge collaboration happening. So one of the things that will help us in the recovery is we have this. We, we did not have this in the dot-com bust. And we did not have this kind of connectivity in 2009. Many companies, and I know most of you, started moving to video instantly, right? You might have had Teams or Zoom or Cisco, WebEx or other facilities on your laptop, but you never used it. Today, it is automatically the new normal, and we're never going back. And devices are king again, right? We want high-powered, high-value devices. A few years ago, I was telling you all that Devices aren't important anymore because of the ubiquitous and sort of omnipresence of technology around us. Even thin clients would be fine, but not so much. In this crisis, our devices are super important. We need the best phones, we need the best laptops, and we need the best connectivity. And in the high tech industry, we see huge increases in sales and revenue. In all this, data privacy and cybersecurity couldn't be any more important. Companies are asking us, we want to do video, we're in the defense industry, but how do we do that safely? How do we make sure that information is protected? And this is where clients are focusing right now. And those that did not make the right investments are in trouble. And many will not recover. Let's talk about employee health and how COVID-19 is potentially killing unprepared businesses, but how the survivors will make it. When you think about employee health, the development and preparedness of companies, they're gonna to have to make new investments in emergency response. How are we gonna manage people in the office? We need, we need to implement new workplace policies, social distancing policies. Even at Avasant and many of our clients, we, will be, we are planning to be checking temperature of people as they walk in. This is not going to be an easy return back to work. We're going to have to decide who actually comes back to work and maybe who doesn't. People can continue working from home. I've spoken to more of our clients in the past three weeks 
than I have in the past six months. And in every one of those conversations, they're telling me the vendors that work with us will likely never come back into the office. The service providers, the staff augmentation, the IT vendors, they're never coming back. Think about that. What does that do for facilities, physical plant? Now, for those that are coming back, it does mean that there'll be less people in the office. We need to invest in housekeeping and sanitation, in buying masks for our employees. We're doing all of those things. And we will need to make vaccination subsidies. In some countries, we expect they'll be very expensive. Employers will need to pay for this and certify that people are COVID free. I myself, in fact, went and did a COVID-19 test just day before yesterday. And thankfully, it came out negative. But not so thankfully, I don't have the antibodies either. So I'm completely unprotected, right? But we're going to need to know that information about our employees. How does that impact privacy? What type of waivers will we need? How are we going to encourage their mental health throughout all this and their fitness? People are working at home. They're less active in some cases, in others more active in other cases. How, how are they feeling not interacting with people in the way they have in the past? Even in our own firm, we've been focusing on the mental health of our employees who we already are seeing strains. We have to be hopeful for our people so they continue succeeding for us, but they are not immune to the challenges around us and our companies. So when will we return to work? This is a very tough question. What I can tell you is we are, we are not returning to work overnight. I think we all understand that. But the cycle for how we got into this is not unlike the cycle it will be to get out of this. And we've been speaking to experts around the world, the CDC, airport officials, government officials. And so as we got into this through social distancing, enhancing office sanitation, prohibiting meetings over 20 people, impl impact, implementing travel restrictions, and ultimately where we are today in most locations is some level of lockdown, we are expecting to unwind in a very similar way starting with social distance policies, testing of employees that are coming back to the workplace, managing checks, precautions, vaccines, et cetera. How long will it take? It's not gonna be less than six months that we get through that. And we're not going to have any normalcy, I'm quite certain, and this is what most of the officials that I speak to have told me until we actually have a vaccine that is mass produced. So we have to prepare for the long term. Let's talk a little bit about the digital and global supply chain supported by omnichannel platforms. The great stories in all this, the survivors that invested in digital and global supply chains are showing tremendous success right now. Even those that we would call laggers Walmart, Costco, Kroger, Target are in position for significant growth. These essential businesses are seeing un, unheard of growth. You look at Amazon, 1.7 trillion. They were about 1.5 trillion a month and a half ago, market cap combined with Alibaba. But these born, in the, born online enterprises in some ways are even more reliable than the old brick and mortar natives that have now gone digital. And the interesting thing about it is we are ordering our groceries. We are ordering our food in this fashion. And these essential businesses continue to op operate. Interestingly enough, businesses like Target, Walmart, which are also brick and mortar, 
okay, Costco, because they also sell food, they're, they're essential. But they're able to push all types of other goods through that supply chain. Think about that. What advantage does a Costco or Walmart or Target have over a Macy's? They can maintain open stores, at least in California and many jurisdictions across the United States where Macy's might have to be closed. Consider the impact of that on that brick and mortar business. So this is, this is changing forever. My own wife, who was a holdout on buying online, has become a convert, and I thought it would never happen. As quickly as we all moved to video, she moved to buying online. And I think, I think that's, the, that's the, one of the, maybe one of the positives for, in this in silver lining. Strategic vendor relationships. So COVID-19 is rebalancing vendor relationships. On the challenges and risk side, we see travel and immigration restrictions, pressure to reduce cost, business continuity and risk mitigation. These are the challenges, right, and risks. Travel, there's silver lining there as well though. Many clients are saying that they're seeing their vendors more. Many are arguing that they're getting more value from them. On the on the, uh, because they are having more regular conversation in video. Many are asking for cost reductions. Some of them are unfair. I would encourage all of you to be fair to your vendors. This is not the time to put them out of business. We need them. And I think that asking for unreasonable cost reductions is not the right thing to do in this environment. Expecting them to push out payments, to allow for moving to longer terms, 30-day terms to 60-day terms, very acceptable, maybe 90-day terms. Some cost reductions, yes, makes a lot of sense. But be fair. And redirect some of that investment toward business continuity. The operating models are changing changing substantially. If you are a service provider, like an IT service provider or a BPO service provider, you're now operating remotely. By the way, it's probably gonna remain that way. Your ability to be on site for the near term is gonna be limited and for the long term, will probably never fully recover. And that may not be a bad thing. Customers will see savings because of that and operational costs will be reduced and automation will be increased. And I think that will benefit everyone and it will make those relationships stronger. One of the interesting thing about rebalancing vendor relationships is the frequency of RFPs out of procurement, I believe will drop. It's hard in this near term to hire somebody over video conferencing. More likely we will renegotiate with incumbents and that's okay. We have relationships with them, we trust them, they understand our environments and we don't want a lot of disruption. And I think for the near term, we're gonna see more and more of that. That's not a failure by procurement. That's, that doesn't mean that we're not getting the best price, but it does mean that we are going to limit some of the impacts of transition and focus on stability and automation in these environments as we move forward. This is a very interesting slide. Um, and I want all of you to uh, sort of take a deep breath on this one. If you look at it by industry, the blue dots represent what we were contracting with vendors prior to COVID-19 as a percentage of offsite or offshore workforce versus onsite workforce. Okay, so what are the typical case studies? Well, simple ones, you know, you're outsourcing your data center, you're outsourcing uh, your um, financial uh, support, 
um, you know, all your applications, AMS, we would always have some on-site presence in those engagements, coupled with some off-site presence. And most of the companies that we speak to would tell you it was really important to have some on-site presence. They didn't really feel comfortable sending it all to India or Mexico or wherever they're sending it to or Ohio. But look at how that starts shifting. Okay, look at how that starts shifting to off-site. And this is just in the first month. That red line is moving higher. And what impact that will have, not just on our contracts and how they need to be negotiated, but on price structures and also on our internal cost for facilities is, is, is amazing. This is not bad for your vendors. This is not bad for you. We're finding ways to be able to reduce cost over the long term and improve service, that's a win-win for everyone. But look at the impact by verticals. There's certain verticals that are gonna move slower to this, like public sector. But there are others that are moving very, very quickly that historically we're not willing to. BFSI, high tech, travel and transportation, pretty significant pretty significant numbers. This single slide has probably produced the highest level of impact um, in the last, I would say, 45 days of any material that we've shared. We published this early on where we wanted to provide to our clients specifically some vision into what is going to happen for us to get to normal operations again. And if you look at the delivery risk impact, we can see here how quickly the coronavirus moved us to a state of emergency and how quickly it moved us to remote working. We're talking probably two to three weeks. And that in the short term did impact many of our partners and vendors ability to deliver in the immediate term. And we've seen force majeure vendor failures, SLA failures, for example. But interestingly enough, those same partners have also been very adaptable. And they've permitted customer self-help measures in many cases, bringing in new technologies, new vendors on a rapid basis. We're now, as we move forward, we need to start thinking about how to restructure those deals not just from a cost perspective, which I think is easy for most of us to understand, but from a delivery perspective. This is an opportunity to move more in the cloud. This is an opportunity to go through those investments that people weren't willing to make six months ago out of fear. Now have become a necessity. We have to invest in that new network now. We didn't want to, now we have to. We, we have to invest in that new SaaS-based platform or solution or software technology. And as we see vendors begin to re-engage in these new ways, we'll have to drive larger investments in business continuity to make sure that we're actually driving those solutions to what the business needs. There will be some terminations of old deals, but there'll also be signing of new deals. And this is probably one of the, again, silver linings in all of this. We are gonna drive transformation of our businesses in an unprecedented way because of this need to survive. And this transformation in the long run will be good. It'll protect our employees, provide us better access to our customers, and it will provide hopefully a healthier relationship with our vendors. Restructuring vendor relationships post COVID-19. So clients are expecting a lot of transparency in this new model. I mentioned to you previously that incumbency right now is king, but that's gonna mean more transparency, benchmarking, pricing, and there'll be contractual impacts. 
we have to write in provisions for remote delivery and security. There are a different set of HR policies now around social distancing. What makes people comfortable or uncomfortable? I, I can tell you, I have some elderly family members, like most of us, and they're very, very worried because this virus seems to be impacting the elderly, the weak, in a more vicious way. And their threshold for social distancing is very different than the threshold that you or I may have. And that's something that needs to be considered. It's not just what the CDC or the US government or our state governors tell us. It's also the comfort of people. And as they come back to work, we will have to consider the contractual impacts there. Restructuring contracts, they need to be focused on integrated business capabilities. What does that mean? Integrated business capabilities means that no longer can we have an IT support contract that is not business outcome driven, period. Integrated offsite offshore, that means more video, more broadband, more 5G. It means real time reporting. It means real time SLA tracking. It means communication 24 by seven. And I'll tell you, that's putting a, already putting a great impact on our people and I want you to consider that as well. We've been running on adrenaline for the last 60 days. I just showed you a timeline that's gonna take us out nine months. We potentially have a multi-year recovery. We have to consider the long-term health of our people. And so these, these relationships offsite, onshore, we gotta be compassionate. Those days where we say, oh, well, they're the vendor. They can take a meeting at 3 a.m. in the morning. Nuh-uh. That's not sustainable. We will need to find ways to work in a mutual and collaborative and friendly and healthful way. New compensation structures. Certainly, incentives are going to change. How we pay people will change. How they clock in and clock out of work will change. How we make sure that they're doing their job. I was talking with one of my clients who's the CFO of a large financial services organization. They heavily staff AUG, this company. And how are they gonna track what people are doing when they're not in the office? When 90% of that staff augmentation happens right in front of your nose. So these are all redefined relationships and we are going to have to build new contracts. The old ones will not work. But what will come out of this from a delivery impact is increased resiliency, better compliance with government regulations, focus on business continuity and contingency emergency management, independent service quality assurance. What does that mean? We have to keep checking on the health of our deals in real time. Stronger data privacy and security goes without question. And what information we have to protect that we didn't have to protect before. In my organization, I never had to collect any health information on my people and I could keep it confidential. Which means I didn't ask, need to ask them questionnaires about their health. Today I do. What systems do I need? I didn't need them before. And of course, more service delivery transparency, okay? This is, this is really truly transformational. And it is actually, um, there again, all of this, some silver lining, some not so good stuff. Life will return to normal, but it's certainly not gonna be the same. So I have some final takeaways. And then what I really wanted to do is take the balance of the time and open up to questions. And I'm very, very open, as most of you know, to answering questions. And if I don't have the answer, that's fine, but I can certainly provide you a perspective. 
there will be real human impacts far beyond the virus itself. And we're already seeing them. Um, ability to stay in shape, mental health, uh, socialization health, uh, how people will react when they come back to the office, huge, huge impacts. And they're going to continue for many years. How many of you know an elderly person or even someone in your own family that is completely traumatized? They can't get their head out of the television screen. They are watching CNN and Fox repeat on news cycles every 30 minutes watching the same thing. What do you think it's doing to their mind? I encourage you, and I say this as a CEO of Avasan, to consider the impact. I am now telling, kindly requesting, all of our employees to stop watching the news. Read the news, okay? Read the news. Focus on long-term problem solving. We will experience extended financial instability and recovery. I showed you the impacts on labor markets, okay? If we see anywhere near the 20% unemployment levels, and if the IMF is correct that we are heading for a 1930 Great Depression type of uh, result. We all have to prepare. Sadly, that means we're all going to be hoarding cash. And that also, unfortunately, has an impact on recovery. But I would encourage all of you to be considering and thinking in your planning that we need to be making longer term planning investments. We may not completely recover for another six to eight years or, or potentially longer. I don't think it will be longer. But I also am no longer a believer that this will be an instant recovery. Our vendor relationships and business environment must adapt. And this, it is no longer, it is not about driving cost reduction alone. I'm gonna stress that. It is not about driving cost reduction alone. I've had conversation after conversation with our own clients. And the first thing they say is let's reduce by 30%, let's reduce by 20%, we're gonna cut them, cut them, cut them, okay? It's about transforming those vendor relationships, which will result in some cost reduction if done correctly. But those relationships have to change as we've discussed. So we will recover from COVID-19, but I don't believe we're ever really gonna be the same. Um, and, and, you know, consider how impactful this has been for not just your work environment, but your families. Some great silver lining in all this. In my neighborhood, I see people taking walks. I met my neighbors for the first time <laughs> in about 15 years. We're social distancing, but we're spending more time with our children. We're spending more time on video conferencing. I've contacted old friends that I haven't talked to in years. So there are some human benefits and I think it's important to focus on those. Be safe. I can open it up for questions. I know we have plenty of time. Hi Kevin, we have questions in the Q&A as well as the chat and I can just read them to you if that works. Sure. Great. So first one, Netflix, Zoom, et cetera, those companies that are the winners, uh, have, been able, have they been able to keep up with the drastic increase in demand and use, or have you seen any of them struggle? Uh, we have seen them struggle, obviously, and I think that one area of struggle is um, supply chain, right? Uh, getting goods and services delivered to the house um, has varied. If you are a, uh, a technology-based solution like a Netflix, you've probably done a better job although bandwidth limitations have been there for the most part. Um, those in the United States have been able to upgrade accounts with their uh, service providers, and they've been able to bring the sufficient bandwidth to their homes. So for the most part, other than the fact that all your children are probably trying to get on Netflix while you're doing a video conference at the same time or doing Zoom and other meetings, um, these services are actually doing very well, um, and there haven't been uh, as many uh, challenges from that standpoint, surprisingly. Um, however, uh, delivering to the home continues to be an issue, uh, even for Amazon, 
um, Walmart, Costco, other North America brands, um, supply chain is taking longer than usual. And, and I think that that's to be expected. Um, uh, that said, I don't think that that's a long-term impact. I think we're going to start seeing in the next uh, three to four weeks um, a big and significant change in the ability to uh, bring goods uh, to, the, to the home in a more rapid way. Great. Okay. Given all the data available to us in contemporary times, enhanced communications and technology, why does it seem overall that we did not anticipate a risk like this and by extension did not prepare and react quicker? Governments were almost surprised and therefore so too the citizens. Uh, remember 9-11, okay? Um, nobody had any contingency plan. Ah, but that's not true. There were. But on the day that it happened, those plans seem seemingly were non-existent, right? We have uh, for years, and I was talking with, I've talk, been talking to officials at CDC, we have for years had um, contingency plans for this type of calamity, but we weren't willing to listen in many cases, I believe, to the experts. Um, and we did not move fast enough as governments. Govern this is a government failure um, on, a, on a catastrophic level. We absolutely have plans for this. We even have a, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it, emergency stocks of, and supplies of, of, of goods, but it was never at the level that we need um, to deliver to the states. So I, I'm not an expert in, um, in this, but what I can say is, is that uh, I'm convinced that the planning had been done, but the belief that the calamity of this nature and the requirement to flatten the curve would be so aggressive and so required I don't think anybody really truly anticipated that. And I think, uh, and I think we've moved slow. And, 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 that's, and that's why we um, you know, uh, are, are continuing these uh, stay home orders. But um, you know, I, look, we learn, right? I don't think that this is gonna happen again. Uh, we already see the litigation happening. Uh, we, we see uh, a whole new set of policies being drafted on a global basis. And so we will be ready the next time. Thank you. When and you there say will increase, a, there will be a next time. There will be a next time, certainly. When you say increased offsite offshore, do you foresee a role for impact sourcing? Business continuity can be increased with alternative delivery locations like rural BPOs. Yeah, I absolutely. And you know, Avasan has been a big proponent of impact sourcing in 2011. We uh, drafted a report for the Rockefeller Foundation across 23 countries looking at impact sourcing in those countries. It's a widely available report, free to download. But what it looked at was what are the potentials in these geographies for different types of BPO, different types of sourcing. And the interesting thing about it is how it impacts cost. So um, if you look at Ghana, for example, uh, a typical uh, BPO employee in Ghana might make about $13,000 a year. Now, at the time that we did that study, uh, that would be enough to feed a small village for nearly a year, nearly a year, okay? So huge financial impacts for those regions should uh, we be able to unlock them. Now, um, there are other challenges with impact sourcing. Depending upon geography, the level of education, the level of, of, of uh, skill availability can vary. Um, and, and that means that more training is required. But will this unlock opportunities for more distributed and um, uh, moving to more rural locations for service delivery? 100%. And I won't, wouldn't be surprised if large scale technology providers and vendors upwards of three billion a year are not already looking at making those kind of investments. So silver lining, once again. But again, we're talking about flattening, uh, you know, the, the, again, you know, Thomas Friedman, right? We're talking about further flattening the world and that means more jobs leaving um, established and uh, MNC um, companies uh, from what I would argue is uh, developed countries to lower developed countries. 
Thank you. What's your view on work from home policies that several companies are instituting? Are these here to stay post COVID? Oh, I think so. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, I and I sit on a, a committee um, with the United Nations Global Compact Sustainable Development Group of CEOs, and we've been chatting about the impact. I just gave a, a, a video presentation. Actually, they asked for a two-minute presentation on what we think about remote working and and, uh, and, and ongoing sort of changes uh, post COVID. What I can tell you is that um, these changes are forever, okay? And they, if they weren't forever after 9-11 or even after 2009, they are forever now because um, people are really enjoying video conferencing. I, I can tell you I have not had, I have not spoken to anyone that hasn't really enjoyed it, not just from a social standpoint, but also from a work standpoint. And while we will get back together with our friends and families on a social basis, um, I don't know if that's going to move as quickly on a work basis. And certainly essential employees will be in the office working in teams. There are some things we can never, never substitute with that, uh, that in-person uh, experience, but I can see it fall dramatically. You know, gone are the days of grainy transmissions and, and uh, lag in video communications. Thank you. Policies. <laughs> yes, policies. There'll be many. <laughs> Will there be more manufacturing in the U.S., not as a way to replace distributed supply chains, but more to fortify and build redundancy? New opportunities for local brick and mortar businesses and locations. Oh, we're already seeing that for sure. Um, a lot of local manufacturing happening, uh, 3D printing, uh, cutting down supply chain costs, cutting down shipping costs. Uh, there is a premium on shipping right now, so there will be a drive to, um, to source locally. And I think that's a great way to employ people. But I think a lot of that source locally, as we're seeing, is uh, in automated lights out factories. Um, work is being performed by very few people and, uh, and mainly machine developed. Um, so, you know, I don't, while I do think manufacturing has for some time been shifting back to the United States in, in a more automated way, this will continue this trend. And actually, many of our clients are already talking to us about how they can do more. And so it's going to, you know, it's, this is not a, this is not going to end. And, and I think when we see the impact on the commercial real estate sector, um, it's going to be very attractive to acquire buildings and facilities to support manufacturing in the United States. Um, we already are seeing um, with less impact in commercial centers of human beings, right? People more, what happens when people work from home, you don't need as much physical space to house them at the office. That means we release um, uh, many of those uh, uh, extra square feet, we recover the revenue, and the cost of commercial space goes down. And, and I think we're seeing that already. Uh, futures and projections on the cost of commercial space are tanking, right? Um, and, and we expect that that will continue and that's going to create opportunities for local manufacturing. Thank you. Do you see a need for employees to upskill to meet future market needs slash demand? Uh, wow. There's always a need for upskilling, right? Um, but this economy brings some unique uh, unique aspects to it, okay? There are a few people that are just not comfortable in video conferencing. Some of that is a skill set issue. Um, some of that is, a, is just, you know, there's a certain amount of shyness to it, right? We, and, and so people are going to have to adapt to new working conditions and train. I talked about impact sourcing, and certainly there'll be a lot of training there, potentially, but also with the use of these new tools. Um, and and I, I can tell you, uh, if you are um, uh, retired and you have not had access to video conferencing and you've not had access to uh, working and communicating in, the, in these ways, transporting yourself from one location to the other, I think it's going to be challenging. It's going to be interesting. And, um, and where I see uh, the gap widening is in this age that I'm entering into, uh, you know, around 50 to uh, 65. You know, this is where a lot of training will be, will be required. Um, and, and, it's, and I think it's for the better. I think it's for the better again, you know, um, 
my concern, truthfully, in all of this is I haven't talked to a person that said they're working less. No one has figured out, at least I haven't, how to turn off the computer. We're now online at home all the time and we're always available. And yes, we experienced that in a way after we got our devices in Y2K and we got connected with our cell phones, but the kind of connectivity that we have today and being available all the time, I think that's, I think that's unnatural. And um, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to think about how we train ourselves around, around uh, creating some, some boundaries. Thank you. Can you share your insights on cloud migration, virtualization, and business transformation, picking pace in medium to long term? Can IT services play a role here? Will they be beneficiaries of this? Well, I can tell you, um, in the past 45 days, 90% of the client work that we've been asked to support has been ERP platform cloud transformation. 90%. What does that tell you? Clients are moving aggressively to the cloud. They do not want on-site, on-prem, anything. They want to move to COTS platforms. These were the trends that already existed, now hyper-accelerated. Those of us that were holding back, wanting to be the outlier, hey, I'm going to keep that Microsoft Exchange <laughs> server, um, you're dead unless you move. And our clients know it. I think you all know it. The acceleration to the cloud right now is at a hyper speed level. And if you're not able to transform your business quickly enough, you won't have a business. Thank you. As COVID-19 is spearheading changes, including digitization and automation journey in BFSI area as a service provider or enabler of this automation, how can we perform effective due diligence via remote working and connection? Can you tell us key elements that should be considered to shift to the new approach on due diligence? This is a tough one, okay? I'll tell you what we're doing uh, for some of our clients and, and uh, in, these, in these relationships is because we have people um, in the same time, time zone as um, the service providers, uh, those people in the time zone um, are doing IV and V, independent verification validation, due diligence, checking in, uh, going through checklists, calling, uh, meeting and interviewing people in video in real time. The hard part with kicking the tires is, uh, and doing any kind of due diligence is, clients will not be able to physically probably travel for some time to your, to those facilities um, that you have. So you wanna show them uh, what a great work job you're doing, what your man traps look like and all your investments and cybersecurity and people and all that, it might be tough. But ongoing, I think clients are gonna to wanna to be more, um, those individuals that are, that are buying those services are gonna to wanna to be more connected. So we will need to find ways to do that in real time. And I don't think, um, I don't think the, uh, the old ways of doing that are gonna work. Um, so I don't have all the answers to this one, but I do think that uh, we do need to offer uh, companies the ability to do real time due diligence um, you know, in the time zone where the services are being delivered, either with the support of their own employees in those regions uh, or with the help of others like, uh, like our company or even within groups within our own service provisioning organizations that report uh, and provide uh, that type of um, information in a very transparent way. I had mentioned early on that transparency is gonna be key here, and we're gonna get there by investing in the right systems and automation and instant reporting. Um, I think we're gonna get there and clients are gonna be more comfortable. Uh, if they feel like they've got the dashboards that give them visibility into how work is being performed, then I think they're gonna rely less on the constant due diligence of checking over the shoulder of a service provider as to whether they're doing a good job. The SLA reporting once a month that we've been doing or once every two weeks, in other words, it's not gonna work anymore. We're gonna need more real-time 
um, reporting. Thank you. Okay. How do you see organizations sustain through this recession and cost cutting while balancing job cuts and the human element? So thankfully, uh, we did not lay anybody off at Avasan. We've done some limited furloughs, um, not affecting more than about 2% of the population. So 98% of our people are still working. Um, that being said, it has been, uh, like for most, a, a very uh, tough time. Um, and uh, we did institute uh, cost cutting in our own business um, and also uh, pay cuts um, you know, graduated with the uh, uh, executives taking a higher pay cut uh, with uh, line consultants taking a much lesser pay cut. That was, um, I think, what we've done we've, we, as a business. Now, other businesses I know are doing much of the same thing, um, you know, trying to, you know, sort of uh, batten down the hatches, uh, prepare for the long term, um, get cost into the black. Um, you have to project what your true revenue potential is against your AR as a business um, as you examine and target what your cost cutting needs to be. And that means some businesses are going to shrink. They will have to. Um, you can't continue operating on pre-COVID-19 levels of cost. And without making a strategic decision now, you're going to run out of cash. And many companies will run out of cash in the next three months if they do not make the right decisions. I'm thankful we were very much on top of all this. We had a um, global uh, event uh, uh, and summit uh, actually in March uh, 8th uh, and 9th. We canceled it. Uh, it's a disappointment for many of us, but we canceled it because of the awareness of the travel impacts on people and the health impacts. And since then, we. Um, we have been uh, making our investments in ensuring that we have a long recovery cycle and we can sustain through it. And I'm confident that we have made those adjustments. But those adjustments, as I said, are not just cost cutting, they're also focused on new lines of business investment. They're focused on uh, employee health, um, in reducing physical plant cost, operating cost where we can, and looking at this new normal as a new business model that we have to adapt to. We need a new business case for our, for our organizations, all of us. Thank you. We have about two minutes left. So were there any more questions? Yes. Okay. With I'll more take, businesses take going off. online and geography becoming less important, do you see a spike in organizations becoming more global with hiring happening across the world rather than being local? Also, how does that impact employee compensations versus business costs? Yeah, it's a very complicated question. Uh, and I say that because, um, you know, today we as a company operate in multiple geographies. Um, and we are incorporated in those countries and regions. Uh, so that includes India, uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, continental Europe, uh, the United States, Canada, Mexico, Trinidad, and others. And so to get uh, incorporated and operate in those, uh, in those jurisdictions is not easy and requires local presence and is not easy to do or manage on a remote basis. So I actually am not seeing tremendous globalization. You would think so because um, of the fact that we're more online and can take advantage of global solutions. And certainly for those companies that are already well established to take advantage of those capabilities on a global basis, they will benefit. But for new entrants, that are trying to globalize their enterprise, there will be a barrier to that. It's going to become difficult. Um, and, uh, and there is a lot more um, auditing happening on a global basis of companies to ensure that they're complying with local tax laws and rules. You can't just set up a virtual environment in a foreign country and not pay your taxes there. Not anymore, anyway, if that was what some were doing. You have to avail yourself to the jurisdiction. And that's becoming more and more difficult today. 
So I, I actually think that that is the case. Now, impacting compensation is more complicated for those companies that are already global. Uh, they will be able to take advantage of lower cost regions. Um, it won't be immediate, um, but over time, they'll be able to Im implement that and put the right training in place. And I think that we will see that impact global compensation negatively. Um, and again, more uh, brain drain um, outside of the United States in the long term. Okay, wonderful. I think we're out of time. Kevin, um, congratulations. You've broken a record for registration for an IOP webinar. Um, I know there are a lot of questions you couldn't get to, so I encourage anyone to drop Kevin an email directly or drop it to us here at IOP and we'll get it to him and you can get those questions answered. And I just want to thank you very much, Kevin, for sharing your expertise and thanking everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you to IOP and stay safe, everyone.